Thank you all for coming. It's incredible to see this much interest and support uh, and to be welcomed by this new community. Uh, I am truly grateful uh, to see you all here and I hope to know you uh, much better over time. When I accepted the invitation to curate this show, I did so in large part because I couldn't think of any scholarly writing or exhibition I'd seen about Chagall and flowers. How could there be a gap like this for such a renowned artist, the third musketeer of modernism, along with Henri Matisse and Pablo Picasso? His work, like theirs, is a veritable cottage industry. I was right about the absence of literature on the topic, but to explain it, I had to ask another question. Who are the great flower painters of the 20th century? Here I had come to the heart of the matter. There aren't any. This is not to say that distinguished artists of the 20th century didn't paint flowers. On the left, Henri Matisse, daisies. On the right, flowers on a table by Pablo Picasso. Of course they did. Whether because flowers are often ready to hand, in the right seasons anyway, or because you don't have to pay them to model, most artists at some point in their career paint flowers, back to Chagall. It's the rare Chagalliste who conjures bouquets first when thinking of the artist's work. Many of them are in this room. It would be more likely to come up with images like these, Eye in the Village, Self-Portrait with Seven Fingers, Rabbi with Torah scroll and the violinist. Did you notice that three out of four of these iconic images have flowers? Today I'd like to nominate Chagall as the great modern flower painter of the 20th century. Of course, it's not that simple. He's not just a flower painter. And if we have time, perhaps we can talk about this in the Q&A. But his prodigious output of bouquets, frequently held aloft by the female figure in a couple, uh, often floating as in birthday on the left, uh, suggesting him and his first wife and great love, Bella Chagall, is reason enough to designate him as such. But Chagall's work also has a particular kind of buoyancy that flies above the darkness of the 20th century. The vibrancy and hope that so often transport us when we look at his work, oh, much to the rich hues and impasto or textured layering of paint, which are so beautifully exhibited in the lovers here. His flowers have an exuberance that belies their short lifespan, much like real flowers. Historically, death and decay often attend flower painting, even if only metaphorically. Take this work and the detail by Rachel Roish and Jan David Steheim from 1705, whose fulsome blossoms are preyed upon by ants and other insects. Sure, it could be a happy coexistence, but maybe not. How could a peony be more sumptuous than these newly cut flowers by Edouard Manet from the 19th century? But look closely the diminutive shears lying nearby at left announce their demise. These works, like many flower paintings, make us aware of time, their memento mori. Ebullient by comparison, Chagall's flowers seem eternal, 
always at their peak. They appear to belie the double-edged nature of still life, which in French, as some of you certainly may know, is termed nature morte, dead nature. And yet, neither Chagall's flowers nor his work more generally can be separated from the cataclysms of two world wars, the displacement and extermination of millions of people, the vast majority Jews, and personal losses. He lived, felt, and responded to these traumas. And you see on the screen War from 1943 and Resurrection from 1937 to 1947, the most difficult years. Born in Vitebsk in predominantly Jewish Eastern Lithuania, and you see its distinctive architecture in both these works on the screen, Chagall was the youngest of eight children, the son of a herring salesman and grandson of a teacher of Torah. In the wake of the expulsion of a million Jews by the Russian army at the start of World War I and the pogroms in the Ukraine in 1919, Chagall left his beloved birthplace, which you see in the photograph below, in 1922, but continued to remember it for the rest of his life and in his art. In his autobiographical poem, My Distant Land, from 1937, he writes, I sing to you, my people, and make my paintings from you. Between Darkness and Light, also 1938 to 1943. Chagall left his second Vitebsk, that's his term, for Paris, for the free zone of the south of France before having to flee the Nazis there in 1941. Along with the experience of war and diaspora, Chagall felt deeply the personal loss of Bella, beloved wife and muse who died suddenly in 1944. Chagall's world is a crucible of memory, both highly personal and broadly collective. And there you see the little rondel with Vitebsk, Chagall and his wife in multiple vignettes here. That he addresses loss and suffering without losing his characteristic joy and whimsy is one of the reasons he's so beloved an artist. It seems fitting that the trajectory of the exhibition starts in the conservatory, where Selby's breathtaking botanicals are illuminated by the Sarasotan light, as well as reproductions of Chagall's stained glass, here, Peace or Tree of Life, in Saubourg, France. Not only does the natural world play a prominent role in his windows, but in work like the large bouquet now on the screen from the cathedral in Metz, he figures the sacral experience through flowers alone. And that's one bouquet extended through all these lancets. Others, like these two examples from the 12 tribes drawn from Genesis in the Abel Synagogue in Jerusalem, figure the sons of Abraham as animals, observing the prescription against graven images or human figures. And we have Naphtali on the screen and God from the GAD from the early 60s. Here, as in his paintings, Chagall uses color to create a chromatic harmony suggesting music, which was very important to him. He wanted to be a singer and violinist, or violinist, rather, as a young man. Um, it suggests music uh, and a way that evokes the term synesthesia, which involves the synthesis of all the arts, which was a huge concept in the early 20th century um, and affected the work of artists like Kandinsky and Matisse as well. And you can see that synesthesia, if you will, um, in the flowers themselves, um, illuminated by the light from the stained glass. So color, um, 
these evocative hues together with light endow Selby's Cathedral of Plants with the spiritual resonance characteristic of Chagall's work. At the same time, they capture its brilliant hues and light. They also suggest its whimsy and defiance of gravity. And here, one of my favorite little details are the epiphyte chandeliers. This is the term of the horticulture team, uh, together with a 1925 painting, uh, The Promenade. A study from 1961, Paradise. Scholars suggest that Chagall's irrepressible optimism and joy, together with his deep-seated belief in feeling and spiritual intent, may reflect in a generalized way Hasidism in Eastern Lithuania, as well as its folkloric traditions and fairy tales. The playfulness of his work, its ambiguity and paradox, are also hallmarks of modernist art and literature. But there is also Chagall's reverence for nature that led him to hold a rock or a flower next to a, a painting to determine whether it was finished. Obviously, if it held up, it was. Um, and here I'm showing you the peculiar uh, and wonderful coincidence of a collection known for its bromeliads that are way up there in the sky and Chagall's gravity-defying figures uh, that we see in Lovers Under a Red Tree from 1966. From the gardens, we move to the mansion, where we see photographs chronicling Chagall's life from his youth in Russia to his halcyon years on the French Riviera. He became a naturalized French citizen, but not before his work was shown in the infamous degenerate art show. I'm showing an image on the screen. In Munich, 1937, where the work of most of the great modernists was held up to uh, ridicule by the Nazis in 12 venues throughout Germany and Austria. Uh, I should say that basically, if you want to know who the most famous artists of the 20th century are, you should go and look up the Degenerate Art Show. Um, five years later, he, his wife Bella, and daughter Ida barely escaped the Vichy regime, fleeing to New York with the help of Alfred Barr, who founded the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the Guggenheims, and some other wonderful philanthropists. So let's applaud the philanthropists who are here today. Uh, these people enabled many of the great European painters, a number of whom are pictured in this extremely uh, captivating photograph. Um, in the Pierre Matisse Gallery in New York, this is the son of Henri Matisse, um, who were um, lucky enough to be able to escape from Europe, and the list is quite staggering. Um, Chagall is uh, se uh, second from the right. Um, he is uh, next to uh, Fernand Leger and Max Ernst, um, and it just goes on and on as the label shows you. A very male group. <laughs> yes, we can talk about that later also. <laughs> we move to and through the hallway which charts, and I love that it's kind of passageway, it charts through photographs like these, Chagall's diasporic journey from Russia to Paris to New York, from New York back to France and the French Riviera. And you're seeing uh, Chagall with the skyline of New York behind him, and Chagall in his garden, Les Collines in Vence in the south. His experience of leaving home resonates deeply with many of us in this room, as does his love for a sun-drenched utopia by the sea and the fact that the microclimate of Sarasota and the French Riviera is so similar, is just too delightful 
for words. Let me show several more images that will anticipate what you see when you experience the paintings themselves in the North Gallery. Two of the three, including the lovers of 1937, show couples, one of the most frequent themes in his work. And I can't resist showing you double portrait with wine glass, 1916, and around the same time, lovers in pink, a whole series in different hues of Mar and Bella Chagall. Then we have another picture, which I'm saving for later, uh, showing a reclining poet. Here are two earlier works, uh, The Poet with the Birds, uh, which is on your left, and um, The Reclining Poet, both from uh, the second decade of the 20th century. We've already seen the city of Vitebsk, and this is how it's shown in Around Her from 1945. And on the screen, um, a work entitled Couple Above Saint Paul. Um, this is another city that recurs again and again in his work. Um, the hilltop village where he spent the last 35 years or more of his life. Uh, Chagall reprises these themes again and again, making them new every time. 